Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupont. And today we're going to be discussing family planning. Family planning is interesting because it's one of those areas where the role of the clinician, the role of the provider, may go outside of the bounds of what a lot of people consider medicine. Okay. It may go into the realm of, shall we say, healer, counselor, um, source of information. Um, one of the things I will say is that um, there are very different um, thoughts, feelings, beliefs throughout the world with regard to family planning. Also. Some people believe that access to family planning is, is a fundamental right. Yes. Other people believe that um, family planning goes against um, a master plan um, and is something that um, certain religions are not comfortable with. Yeah. Um, so today we're going we're gonna to talk about all those issues. Yeah. Uh, so one of the first things, um, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story. When I was down um, practicing in the Dominican Republic and I was asked to do a talk about family planning, so to speak. And um, this was a country where the Catholic Church is quite strong. Yes, it is. And um, certain um, interventions, certain family planning strategies um, were not permissible to be discussed, right. communicated, um, or taught in the schools. Right. And one of the other um, groups that had been down there previously had, had violated that, and they were actually no longer welcome to go into the schools. So it's important if you're um, thinking about discussing family planning, that you're aware of what are, what are the social um, mores, what are the religious beliefs in the area, what are the judicial or legal um, constraints. And so one of the issues there was um, we had talked about um, a young man or a young woman might wanna, and this was, was a school, a high school basically, so these were young men and women and it was a discussion about one of the ways that they might um, prevent pregnancy. And we were allowed to say, one may consider protection. You may use protection, uh -huh. but you couldn't get any more specific than that. You couldn't mention condoms or any other barrier type of um, family planning right. um, tool, technique, strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, have you, have you had Somewhere, you know, you, you travel oh, quite a bit. So well, does, I didn't have to travel for this anecdote. I, I can tell you that for many, many years, I used to give a lecture to the School of Public Health at Columbia uh, on environmental issues related to ecological devastation of encroachment into natural systems. It sounds like a fancy word, but it means deforestation for farms to raise more food, to feed more people. And... Um, Prior to the first lecture in that series was given by our dean of the School of Public Health, who we've named an entire building after, Alan Rosenfield. And he was a, an enormous proponent of family planning strategies ranging anywhere from uh, free condom give-outs to public health education at every level, uh, particularly in countries like Thailand and Cambodia, Laos. Southeast Asia was an area where he concentrated most of his activity. Mm -hmm. But he, he always used to come back to the fact that the Pope, the Roman Catholic, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, was a huge influence in preventing people from adopting birth control measures, such as the pill or uh, IUDs or condoms. The only thing they would approve of, according to his interpretation, was abstinence. So I, when I started my lecture, I would start by saying, um, excuse me, Dr. Rosenfield, can you please name the countries in Europe that have the lowest population growth? And he looked at me the first time I asked him that question with a puzzled look on his face. And he said, what are you driving at? I said, well, which countries in your view have the lowest growth in human population? And so he says, well, most of Europe is at a ZPG growth rate right now. He said, in fact, some are negative. So ZPG, zero population growth? Zero. Zero population so, growth. So I said, which ones do you think are negative population growth? And he says, well, because uh, he was an expert on population. And he says, well, Italy is one of those countries, and France is another one. I said, stop right there. I said, what, what country, by the way, has more Catholics than any other country? And he says, well... Italy per, per thousand people. 
I said, but apparently they're practicing some form of birth control because they have a zero, they have a negative population growth. And France, the other large Catholic country, also has a negative population mm -hmm. growth. So I, I said, how do you account for that? <laughs> and he smiled and he turned around and walked out of the room. <laughs> he wouldn't answer the question. What he meant to say, I think, was that the Pope has an enormous influence on Latin America, where most of the uh, out of control growth is perceived to occur. That may not be true, but that's the perception. So my take on family planning relates more to economic growth than it does to preventing the number of people. Because as we've learned, countries that have a, an increased rate of uh, GDP have a lower birth rate as the result. And there's a point of where it crosses over uh, where you can exceed X numbers of dollars per family. And until that happens in all of the less developed countries, the growth rate will always be out of control because people are trying to replace children that don't grow up old enough to survive into adulthood. And that's, I think, the basis for um, the problem that we face. And it's, a, it's an issue that doesn't relate necessarily to your religion, but rather to who will be left when I get old enough where I can't do anything else, I can't even walk, I can't move, I might be bedridden, I might not be able to work. Will I have any children left to carry on the family legacy for me? And I think that that's a very common attitude. And I don't think it's fair to blame a religion on that. I think it's a practical aspect of poverty. I think that's, that's my take uh, on that. No, no, I, I actually think that's really um, a good way to, to spin this because we do a lot of times, um, we want to be, um, righteous we want to be yeah, indignant we, yes, we want to say if only so and so wasn't wasn't thwarting my attempts <laughs> to make the world a wonderful place that doesn't work like um, and I, I think it is more complicated than that and in a lot of areas there's a big economic impact on decisions on opportunities on population growth that's right and one of the things that uh, even though it's sort of broader than the topic of family planning but reduction in child mortality yes often usually translates into less pregnancies and that's less right. births. And that's, that's right. an interesting issue. Um, from a more, I'll say, individual focus, let's talk about how, how are the strategies that an individual might approach um, their interest in planning the family, in planning when they get pregnant. Um, and we break it down into, I'm gonna say, four different approaches. And as we talk about each, we'll discuss you know, where and when this might be considered um, acceptable or appropriate. Sure. And one of the first ones that um, is probably the broadest um, application is behavioral. Uh, and this is the decision of whether or not to have sexual um, relations. Because without sexual relations, it's very challenging to get pregnant. Indeed. And so a lot of, um, a lot of context, the one thing they're willing to endorse is abstinence. They're willing to say that's, that one of the options that is acceptable is abstinence. And one of the, you, you cringe. And what's the problem with, what's the problem with recommending abstinence? <laughs> because it's, it says that the other methods that are more commonly used that work really well if you apply them are off limits because we don't approve of them. So we'll so not, pick the only thing that doesn't work and that's abstinence. Abstinence has never worked. If you go on a diet, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> All you can think about is that nice, big, fat, juicy steak that you said you're never going to eat again. And the next time you get a chance, a moment of weakness, you've had too many drinks, perhaps, or you're out with friends and you don't want to seem like an outlier, you'll have that steak. And it, the urge to have sex is part of the human condition. And there's no way in any stretch of the imagination that you can will that urge to disappear just because you think that the other methods of birth control don't are, are, are religious tenets that you don't yeah. agree with. Abstinence has never worked and it so, never will so, work. So I guess I'll, I'll say, so abstinence is um, considered by many to be an approach with a low success rate. I would say zero success, but no. you say low, well, that's fine. Gonna, I, think, I, think we should be, I think we should be fair. <laughs> okay. Some people have more self-control than others. Some do. Um, well, yes. Some people don't drink. 
<laughs> Maybe that helps with self-control. perhaps. Certain cultures, um, abstinence, particularly premarital abstinence, um, um, has some degree of success, but, but that, that's a point well taken. Abstinence is um, generally suggested to have fail a failure rate, a fairly high failure rate. Very um, the next one is we'll call fertility awareness. And okay. this is um, calendar or symptom, right. sort of the rhythm, the that's rhythm right. approach. The this, rhythm. Is, this is where um, individuals may be sexually active, but they're timing or trying to time the, um, the sex relative to the cycle and relative to when a woman might get pregnant. Right. And, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a name, I, I grew up Catholic and there's a name <laughs> so in the, wrong, and there's, the <laughs> there was a name in the, you know, in the Catholic community for people that use the rhythm method. Uh -huh. And we call them, I don't know if you're familiar with this term, but parents, <laughs> um, because this also has a fairly high failure rate too. Right. Um, so, but these can have some, some degree of success. Sometimes people use it the other way. They'll actually use the, the fertility awareness or calendar method to time when they do um, have the highest risk of conceiving. Right. Because they may have decided, okay, now would be a great time in my life to have a child. And so they'll have increased sexual activity right around that time. Um, another, and I'm gonna actually put this in the same, we'll call it behavioral, is prolonged breastfeeding. Right. Not 100% effective, it keeps the hormone but levels high by sure. continuing the yeah. breastfeeding, um, for say two or three years, um, this can actually, again, it's not 100%, nothing's 100%, except maybe abstinence, which 100% doesn't always happen, but um, breastfeeding can actually help with spacing between children. Sure. And the spacing between children can lead to um, maybe better health for the mother and child in certain contexts, um, particularly when resources might be limited. That's right. But um, the best control measure for preventing overpopulation in underdeveloped countries is economic development. I think that's true. And I think that's always sort of the overarching thing for us to be thinking about when we we're focused on individual recommendations, individual family planning. But if you can improve the economic context, that's right. if you can improve the economic opportunities. Sure. Um, next of our four categories, I'm talking about pharmacological. Okay. So our, um, our medicine, um, medication, contraception, which had a huge social impact, I know, in the United States when it was first introduced. Yes. A lot of individuals considered this a, a freedom had, had come on. Absolutely. There was the ability to um, have sex with, with a significantly lower risk of pregnancy associated so, with that. So we'll uh, talk a little, so in the oral contraception realm, <laughs> We're going to say there are, there are three, let's say, pill options. So we have combined, um, which are estrogen, progestin, progesterone combined. Right. We have a um, progestin only. And also we have emergency, yep. where someone might have a, a sexual experience. And then um, in some situations, there can be a morning after pill, as it's called. Sure. Um, injectables. Injectables are another yep. approach. Um, and there's a couple different preparations. Um, one that's quite common through a lot of um, areas of the world is the Majoxy progesterone acetate. And this is 150 milligrams, it's a one milliliter injection. And it's done once intramuscular every three months. Right. Um, one of the things I, I sort of uh, say a pearl again, a thing to think about is when you do this, often the women don't necessarily want their husband to know. <laughs> and in certain cultures and contexts that might be, that might be appropriate for yeah. that separation. So a lot of times they'll ask for this to be done in private. Um, they won't want a Band-Aid because now everyone, why do you have a Band-Aid on your shoulder? Sure. And they'll also, even though the shirt might be um, covering the shoulder, it may not go down very far. So you'll look at doing these injections in a, in a, in a private place, so to speak. Um, private setting in an area where the injection was then gonna be covered with clothing. Um, but again, this is a commitment because this is gonna be in every three months for the injectable. Exactly. Um, patches are another option a little more challenging in a, in a tropical, humid, hot environment, and vaginal rings, medicated um, vaginal rings. Um, mechanical, which I think you alluded to a little bit before, uh, we'll say, yeah. so we have our behavioral, our pharmacological, and we'll say mechanical, this might be condoms. Sure. Famous restaurant in Bangkok, condoms and cabbages. That's right. Um, where condoms are, 
And condoms not only play a role in family planning, but they may play a role in disease trans transmission. Exactly. So interrupting the transmission of sexually transmitted sure. infections. Absolutely. Diaphragms, cervical caps, and vaginal rings. Again, it's got the medication. You're kind of having both effects here. Yep. And surgical. Well, I do IUD is for it. So you're going to put that in mechanical? No, it is. No, I think it's good. Probably. Yeah, so the IUDs will put in a mechanical, and the way they're working is actually by irritating the uterine exactly. lining and preventing implantation. That, you can imagine certain people with religious beliefs can be quite an issue yeah. because it's still allowing fertilization to occur. And, and then, the then gets destroyed. And then, right. exactly. So, um, and then surgical. And yep. the surgical is... is mm -hmm permanent, more permanent, sure. and this would be for the male would be a vasectomy, and for the female might be, well, female sterilization, the tying of the tube, surgical ligation. Yeah, it's a complicated story, and it's still being debated, and we've got, you know, fairly well-developed countries like the United States is still arguing as to whether or not abortion is a method for birth control. I wouldn't recommend that as a birth control measure, mm -hmm. but I would not prevent a woman from determining what happens to her own future by simply stating that the law says that you're not allowed to have an abortion uh, up to a certain number of months after impregnation occurs. Mm -hmm. So it's political, sociological, and then lastly, biological. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult issue. Well, I hope as you've also gotten from our discussion today is People have a lot of strong feelings on both sides. Oh, no um, question about it. And so it. As, a, as a provider, it's a challenge yep. because you're really not there, I should say, advancing your own agenda, but you're there as an advocate for your patient. You're there to listen to their beliefs and to do everything you can to help them advance, um, advance their goals. Yes. Um, so complicated um, area of medicine where it really stretches our cultural competency. That's right our sensitivity, um, and our ability to step outside ourselves and step into the shoes of our patients. Exactly. All right, well, thank you for joining us today. Yep, we'll see you again.